higher education institutions, and our data landscape are closely connected in many ways. We in higher education often analyze data, whether data we've collected ourselves or that collected by others. New innovations of many kind are developed on the basis of our work with data, and we also train students to work with data. Our data imaginaries these days are drastically different to what they were not long ago. Bigger and bigger data sets are available to work with in higher education, the public sector, and the private sector. Many of us have been trained to think of more data as more potential knowledge, and more scientific knowledge is taken to be a good thing. Many of our careers are entirely dependent on the ability to work with new data. We're incentivized around our ability to produce new techniques or results or even data infrastructures. In general, when we try to publish or get funding, big data is taken to be a positive. But of course, there's always been evidence of the negative side of the power of data. Although many of us were never educated in that history, so our thoughts don't go in that direction, and we might only think about how we and society can benefit. However, it's increasingly acknowledged that data-driven technologies, a term that many of us use to refer to all of these big data uses, including algorithmic systems, can be dangerous, and that they certainly have big implications for how just or unjust our world is. For one thing, it's been a subject of some considerable discussion that data-driven technologies are considered to be a threat to democracy. I imagine you'll have heard about the Cambridge Analytica scandals uh, involving the election of Donald Trump, among many other political scandals involving the company, as well as its parent company, the private espionage and self-described global election management agency, SCL Group. This work began as research, of course. Much of the research that underpinned the election scandals was carried out by a researcher at Cambridge University. I say this because even when we are acting in a so-called personal capacity, say doing consultancy work or moonlighting, the fact that we have a connection with higher education institutions, especially respected ones, lends credence to our work. We all know that, as researchers, we're encouraged to do things like create new technologies that can be monetized, create spin-out companies, and to have industrial partnerships with big-name organizations. The boundary between academic and commercial research is blurry in these cases, and the impact agenda encourages us to make it more blurry. I think it's also useful to think about our students in this context, the skills we teach them and how those skills are used. This is true for all our students, but especially our PhD students, since they may actually trade off the names of our institutions and maybe even our own names as their supervisors. And with these net names lending credence to what they do, the, our ethical responsibilities may, are more serious, I think. We need to be teaching them not to harm people. And I would argue that if we don't, then we share some culpability in how they use the skills that we help them gain. In addition to the threat to democracy, there's the ever-growing enormous mountain of evidence that data-driven technologies are a threat to marginalized people, including the poor, ethnic minorities, and trans people. Not necessarily three separate groups of people. But here are some, just some examples. I could talk about this literally all day, but just a few. These problematic data tech examples are all underpinned by research. So... It's been found that self-driving cars seem to be more likely to kill black people. It's been found that hiring algorithms used by at least one powerful tank company, um, a company that claims to be responsible, discriminated against women. There's the exam algorithmic scandal, not the A-level one that was successfully challenged in the courts, but a more devastating one in which international students have spent the last seven years trying to prove their innocence after falling victim to a flawed voice recognition algorithm that the UK Home Office used that accused them of cheating. Thousands were deported, and obviously dreams crushed. Then there's many scandals around facial recognition technology. This many of you might have heard of because there are some serious problems, including that middle-aged white men seem to benefit from the most high accuracy rates, with black and Asian people were up to 100 times more likely to be misidentified than white men, depending on the particular algorithm and type of search. Native Americans had a very high false positive rate, but it wasn't just about race. There was a problem with gender, too, with black women having very low accuracy in particular. In fact, one study found that poorest accuracy consistently was in subjects who were female, black, and 18 to 30 years old. And these failures have huge implications. So 
There's this New York Times story. Robert Julian Borchak Williams wrongfully arrested based on a flawed match from a facial recognition algorithm. Police arrested him in his house in front of his children who cried as they watched their father bundled into a police car. Williams was detained for 30 hours and then released on bail. And we all know that he's lucky to have survived an encounter with the police who believed him to be a criminal. This case was thought to be the first in the U.S., but it wasn't the first, and it's not a one-off. In 2019, the racial bias against non-white skin and facial recognition tech led to 11 days in prison for Niger Parks in New Jersey. And there are other kinds of ethical issues as well. So work by Os Keys, Nikki Stevens, and Jacqueline Vernemont found that facial recognition technology research and development was entirely entangled with extremely unethical uses of data, exploiting the vulnerable. And they report that the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, who maintain the Facial Recognition Verification Testing Program, which is the gold standard test for facial recognition technology, that it uses images of children who've been exploited for child pornography. It uses images of people who've applied for U.S. visas, especially those from Mexico, and it uses images of people who've been arrested and are deceased now, as well as mugshots of people booked on suspicion of criminal activity. So when an organization or even university researchers want to test a facial recognition algorithm, they send that software to this institute, who then use this full set of photographic collection to test the algorithm for accuracy and other measures. So this is a very serious set of ethical problems, and several of these are tied up with the police. And indeed, when it comes to data-driven tech and policing, there are a lot of issues. In 2019, the Home Office funded a national rollout of mobile fingerprint scanners linked to immigration databases, effectively turning the UK police into a border force out on the streets. The Racial Justice Network and Yorkshire Resists organizations released a report on the impact of the biometric services gateway, as this is known. These mobile biometric devices are handheld fingerprint scanners that police officers can use to check on the spot, a person's identity by matching the image of the fingerprint taken against the police and immigration biometric databases. And they do that without taking the person into custody. This is going a step beyond just demanding that people show their papers. This seems to be a first step in bringing in more on the street automated surveillance because the Home Office has already declared its intent to its interest, at least, in using facial recognition tech in this same way. According to the report, the communities targeted by the police, as well as the wider public, see this as an extension of the racist stop-and-search practices, and they worry about how this kind of use of biometrics will lead to further criminalization of migration. The report cites FOI data from West Yorkshire, which shows disproportionate use of the mobile biometric scanning on ethnic minorities, particularly Black, Asian, and European immigrants. Given that the Home Office was caught having destroyed its own records, setting off some of the windrush chaos that is ongoing, and the fact that there is an ongoing problem with the hostile environment destroying the lives of even British-born UK citizens like Carl Noazota, is there any reason to trust that the use of these data-driven technologies will not be increasing injustice? Now we come to the NHS. So this, I hope, has come to your attention at least a little bit because there have been some big developments recently. There's the GP data grab, which I hope is on your radar, but also major problems with what is known as the COVID-19 data store, which is the largest aggregation of patient data in UK history. In relation to this data store, journalism platform Open Democracy and tech justice nonprofit Foxglove have ended up having to take the NHS to court to force the publication of the four initial contracts with tech companies that have been set up for access to this data store. So the four companies are Faculty, also known as Faculty Science Limited. They used to be known as ASI Data Science. They're a company who changed their name after their involvement in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal became public. The second company is Google, who are most notable in this context for their huge confidential NHS data breach, which resulted from machine learning research collaboration with the NHS and Google DeepMind, a data breach that was referred to by one commentator as trust demolition. The third company is Microsoft, who have a less than stellar record for safe handling of data. And the fourth one is Palantir, who in some ways are in a league of their own in terms of ethical and political concern. 
Palantir is a CIA-backed data firm known for supporting the CIA's counterinsurgency and intelligence operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, including work on autonomous bomb-carrying drones, but also carrying out espionage on behalf of states of their enemies, including spying on the Dalai Lama for China. In 2019, Palantir was criticized widely for its technological support for the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE's brutal regime of deportations. It also has an extensive and controversial history with U.S. police as they're involved in predictive policing, sometimes called pre-crime. The government wants Palantir to process our sensitive NHS data. So there are huge problems with transparency here, like many other government contracts at the moment, but this is bigger than a one-time problem or a single prime minister or a single secretary of state for health and care. Because despite assurances to the public after the care.data scandal, the NHS has long sold patient data without adequate transparency, including to insurance companies, marketers, and some of these marketers have illegally shared data with third parties. For more information, you can check out theysolditanyway.com. But m even more recent NHS data sharing initiatives have, have been putting at particular risk more vulnerable people. And this is not even counting whatever it is that's going on with Palantir. For years, inaccurate NHS data sharing with the Home Office under the hostile environment policy has caused suffering and loss of life to ethnic minorities, and it has set a dangerous precedent for the use of confidential patient data against vulnerable people. NHS data sharing with the Home Office led to the use of a psychiatrist's notes about a suicidal patient as a basis to reject the young woman and her family's asylum claim. When it comes to unethical breaches of confidentiality, that is truly among the worst examples. A formal complaint about the UK's handling of data about immigrants has been sent to the European Commission, and the scale of harm resulting from the hostile environment continues to come to light. Undeterred by any of this harm, the government has also announced the intention to widen its sharing of patient data, so including the Department for Work and Pensions something participants in research I've been involved with have said would completely take away their feeling of safety at going to the doctor. They've also announced a partnership with Amazon to allow Alexa smart speaker data to be used to identify people for mental health intervention, but also to use Alexa smart speakers to give out NHS advice, particular to patients. Despite evidence that smart speaker data is not kept confidential by Amazon. The most disturbing to me, however, is the joint announcement by MI5 and Metropolitan Police of the intention to share patient data with these entities. I would say that government moves to share data across these departments, the Home Office, DWP, MI5, Metropolitan Police, and with private companies, abundantly demonstrates how they are willing to use personal data that we've not been informed enough to consent to the sharing of, much less being asked if we consent, to harm us either individually or in the marginalized groups that people like me are part of. But thinking back to universities, one thing that seems strange once you see all of this in context is that there are people out there in academia who seem to be pushing the idea that the public should trust data-driven technologies and the government. In fact, there are academics pushing a normative ethical line in favor of health data-driven research and technology. And that goes from the benign but reductive hashtag data saves lives campaign to bolder claims that the opposition to allowing personal health data to flow for anything we might call research is actively harmful, and claims that those who oppose these data flows are responsible for thousands of deaths or incalculably large billions of pounds, let's say, in unnecessary expenditure of tax money. To me, this is very troubling because it seems like academics are colluding when they should be raising ethical questions at the very least. One thing we can say is that outside of academia, at least some of the larger scandals have sparked a conversation about ethics. Big tech companies and governments have made move to fund ethics boards. Um, so if there was a failed attempt by Google or data ethics research groups, such as one run by Microsoft, one, by, one on the part of the UK government, and some organizations have tried writing their own voluntary ethical guidelines. Rather conveniently, a lot of these efforts allow ultimate to control to remain with powerful entities. And so this has led to a concern about ethics washing or ethics theater, the practice of fabricating or exaggerating an interest in data-driven systems that work for everyone. I say this 
especially because raising actual ethical problems in, in some of these institutions seems to cause you to lose your job. Fingers crossed, making this video won't cause me to lose mine. Now, I realize that this might seem like it's only about data science, but it's not. Many disciplines are involved. For example, recently in the UK, some powerful actors, including the Wellcome Trust and the new Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, a body set up by the government to provide advice on governance of data-driven technologies, they've been carrying out or funding research into whether the public finds these kinds of actions acceptable. Now, acceptable is a low bar, and this work, and much work like it out there, offers, often offers a constrained set of choices to members of the public. I would argue constrained for ideological reasons. And it often relies on the notion that the public need to be educated to, in order to make a decision about whether this is acceptable. And in fact, maybe educated as many times as it takes for them to agree that this is all okay. It also often draws upon the idea of a majoritarian perspective. So uh, it focuses on what a majority of people recruited think rather than, for example, thinking about what are the opinions of those most likely to have injustices visited upon them. This work is being done by those with social science, behavioral science, and humanities backgrounds. It uses the methods that many of us use in our own research, even if we're not data scientists, methods that we teach our students. So I would say it's not something for someone else to think about and critique. It's, for, it's work for us to do. I personally am not interested in manufacturing consent for things that might be harmful, I don't think you should be either. Where are the systems that prevent harm from these kind of data uses, harms that are already ongoing in society and that might increase by entrenchment or speeding up that can happen with algorithmic systems? Don't we need to be protecting people at risk before we deploy these things? And certainly before we ask people to be okay with them. I hope it's clear from what I've been saying is that these problems have roots in the unjust world we live in today, and it's not our job to use data to make this, these problems worse, whether big data or small data. On the contrary, I hope that education, higher education, can have a positive impact. But the key point is that all of this work draws on skill sets that we have in higher education institutions. And I would argue that we should be applying our thinking as ethical educators and ethical researchers to these problems. It is work that we can and should critique, both from the point of view of validity, and as you can see, there are huge problems with validity, as well as from an ethical standpoint. We don't need to rely on the law, whether GDPR or any other law, or even some notion of public opinion. We have our own ethical imperatives. The reason we have this requirement to be ethical is not that we researchers and educators are so ethical. It's precisely because we have a history of not being so. Academia is plagued by many ethical scandals up to the present moment, and our institutions are usually a good few steps behind protecting the people from us. So we need to do more, particularly in the face of these kinds of risks, threats, and injustices. We, of all people, know that not everything you might call research is good or ethical. And I will stick my neck out and say, it's particularly important that we step up and oppose blind trust in research or technology because the government that is pushing these things is also up to its neck in scandals. From implementing eugenics policies during the pandemic, so blanket involuntary do not resuscitate orders applied to people, to all of these legal challenges that, are, um, that amount to accusations of corruption in handling contracts, to the huge and ongoing scale of harm from the hostile environment. These are very serious issues, and in my view, there's no way out of this without whistleblowers people who will put up, put their livelihoods on the line to protect us. But I think there's also a huge role for those of us with academic freedom, and I think we need to use it to resist things getting worse. Maybe you feel like it's not your job, but what if the people who are most likely to be harmed by our innovations with data are also the least likely to be in a position to know what's happened and to be able to respond to protect themselves? What if there's very little chance it won't be too late by the time they do know about it? Speaking of whistleblowing, just in case it's useful, I'll mention that the Good Law Project, who've been part of a coalition against the recent NHS GP data grab, have set up this secure drop system to enable you to share information with them if you have any. While we might not all be in a position to be whistleblowers or hand over information, there are certainly lots of things that we can do. And I just want to present now some kind of interesting examples that might be inspirational in thinking about what kind of responses we could have to these kinds of developments. 
So there have been calls to ban facial recognition outright. And in 2019, San Francisco became the first major American city to ban the use of facial recognition software by the police as well as other agencies. And following this, uh, the UK Court of Appeal has found that automated facial recognition technologies were used by the South Wales police were unlawful. And this has been hailed by advocacy group Liberty as a world first victory in the fight against the use of an oppressive surveillance tool. Just a few days ago, the UK's chief data protection regulator has warned about reckless and inappropriate use of live facial recognition in public places. So these are forms of resistance which have kind of worked at different levels. Relatedly, there's work by Amnesty Decoders, who are a worldwide network of digital activists, and they are currently helping geolocate facial recognition capable surveillance devices within New York City so that residents know exactly where the technology is being used. Some have tried to respond to the validity problem within facial recognition technology in a really different way, in a way by trying to make it work better. And indeed, there's a long history of data tech people wanting to solve data tech problems with more data tech. And in that grand tradition, 2019 saw revelations that Google had sent contractors to cities across the U.S. to collect biometric data that it could use to train the facial recognition software that it was developing. Contractors were offering subjects $5 Starbucks gift cards in exchange for 3D scans of their faces. Because they wanted a diverse set of faces, it ordered contractors to prioritize subjects with dark skin and specifically encourage them to approach homeless people who had expected to be more responsive to the gift cards and least likely to object or ask questions about the terms of data collection. Managers reportedly encouraged contractors to mischaracterize the data collection as a kind of game. This is incredibly unethical in so many different ways, but it also has a lot in common with approaches and responses to these problems that have sought greater inclusion of marginalized people within data sets. So this has been done in a range of areas, And it comes along with manufactured concerns, often from above, about risks of not being included. And solutions comes alongside solutions that benefit people other than those at risk of discrimination. So the people who might benefit from a larger data set. And this is why I think that my next example is so interesting. And it is the Please Do Not Include Us AI Ethics and Inclusion Workshop. So it was the beginning of a conversation in a way, but but also just such a fantastic kind of statement to start with, that maybe there are unintended effects of diversity and inclusion that we need to be thinking about and not just trying to expand data sets at every turn. Another inspiring example is No Tech for Tyrants, a student-led UK-based organization that's working to cut the links between higher education, violent technology, and hostile immigration environments. And I'll mention two of their projects that I think are very interesting. So hashtag Recruit Me Not has been mobilizing students to resist Google's influence at universities. So getting universities to pledge not to join the tech talent pipeline and to instead demand for an accountable tech industry that does not engage in racism and censorship. Students commit by signing the pledge to refuse to work for Google until it meets basic accountability demands those which have been set out by Google employees at their walkout for real change. And this Recruit Me Not idea has come about specifically in the wake of Google's silencing and firing of their ethical AI co-leads recently. So it's a kind of response to them showing that in fact they, they're not <clears throat> as serious as they say they are about being responsible with their deployment of AI. No tech for tyrants are also concerned with Palantir's involvement in the UK government, including their partnership with the NHS and partnerships in higher education. So they're very clear that Palantir uses its association with top UK universities to improve its public image. And so they set up Send a Palantir Activity Report page to allow you know people like us to help hold UK higher education institutions to account for their entanglements with this company. These kinds of efforts, I think, are very interesting and also interesting that this one is coming from students, really, and not from academic staff, where I would hope we would be seeing more resistance. 
Another example connected to higher education is the work spearheaded by Unis Resist Border Controls, a national campaign of migrant students, activists, and lecturers fighting against the hostile environment. They discovered that the Cambridge Center for Data-Driven Discovery and Cambridge Neuroscience had both posted advertisements for the UK Home Office's Border Advision Advisory Group, which said the Home Office was looking for academic experts to help construct innovative border technology. In the context of everything we've been looking at, the fact that they were approaching the Center for Data-Driven Discovery and thinking about innovative border technologies, given all we know about their investment in in many other forms of harmful technology, we can see this as an ethical problem. When Unis versus Border Controls in, such, encouraged people to contact the university to express an objection to this kind of work, the adverts were deleted. This suggests that preventing harm may require calling out and questioning this kind of unethical work, both within and outside our institutions. And it may be that it's very useful for us to do this not as just individuals, but in coalition. Another two interesting examples that I would encourage you to look into are the Algorithmic Justice League and Data for Black Lives. Both organizations are from the U.S. and both were set up by black women, but involve kind of large coalitions of lots of people taking action. Within the U.K., one recent development that I think has been quite inspiring is the No to Palantir campaign, which features a huge coalition of actors who I haven't personally seen acting together in such a way in the past. But I look forward to more efforts made by people who are within higher education institutions. So specifically, I hope that people who work in higher education will work more to oppose unethical data-driven research and technology development, both within and outside academic settings. I think we should make that our business. I think we should also use our expertise and our academic freedom to oppose and undermine efforts to manufacture a mandate to carry on with unethical and politically dubious work. So that is to oppose and undermine sham consultations or constrained choice deliberative methods, where we see these kinds of things being deployed, rather than building prestige from partnerships that go along with these things. So that's using data that were gained in unethical ways or looking the other way as others do or emphasizing this aspect of trust rather than focusing on all of the very good reasons people have not to trust. And I also hope to see people supporting whistleblowers and supporting people who are out really trying to protect us from data-driven harm and again joining those efforts supporting and amplifying that work rather than, again, looking the other way and hoping someone else will take care of these problems. Thank you so much for your attention.